Well, welcome back. Uh, believe it or not, we are on session eight. And this session we call the, sec uh, the seventh uh, missionary journey of Paul. And better subtitled, I think, is Paul on the Run. And it's really based off of the clues that we see in Scripture from uh, Paul's journeys uh, in 2 Timothy. So, Gary, you know, two, two sessions ago, we left Paul in Spain. Uh, and last session, we, we really uh, took a little bit of a turn to try to put into context what's going around, uh, going on around the, the Roman Empire right now with uh, Nero, with uh, the fires in Rome, with the uh, Jewish revolt. And now we're getting back to Paul basically coming back. And we, we alluded a little bit uh, last time of, hey, he came back, possibly came back because of Peter, possibly came back because of, of the relationships that he had, but he came back. And um, we know he came back by this letter of Second Timothy. And I guess, you know, let's just start there. Um, Paul gets back, and, and what's he doing, <laughs> for lack of a better term? And I'm going to put this map up that sort of shows the, the, the lay of the land. Uh, but, but what's Paul doing coming back from Spain this quick? Well, uh, I always uh, like to couch this particular situation in uh, the terms of uh, uh, a Bible study, a small group Bible study that was published years ago. Uh, Richard Peace is a professor of evangelism and spiritual formation at Fuller Theological Seminary, was one of the two people that uh, set it up and kind of got credit for the Bible study part. And, and uh, he, uh, it was a Bible study actually for parenting adolescents, but uh, what it did was it used Paul's letters and the way he uh, interacted with uh, mentoring or parenting uh, new Christians. Uh, uh, maturing or even immature Christians and congregations, and uh, even used in his letters parenting imagery uh, uh, about all that. And uh, one of those things that stuck in my mind, and uh, I've read Paul and the letters uh, so much through that lens since then. And uh, just recently, again, uh, reading Luke Timothy Johnson's Constructing Paul, he, he talks about Paul's parenting model for a uh, for that as well. So uh, it, it kind of came back around there too. So Paul's, uh, in this case, like um, a protective parent, I believe. He he knows, he's heard what's going on in the empire. When he's in Spain, it's like uh, he's, he's far west. Well, the whole uh, middle and eastern part of the Mediterranean and kind of goes uh, uh, crazy and uh, things start to fall apart. So uh, there's this international and political moral disintegration that's going on, and uh, it's it's all centered around Emperor Nero. And uh, Paul, uh, I think it may be that that's what made him decide to, or at least uh, p make him feel pressure to get out of Spain and get back to uh, the Aegean Sea, particularly to that area uh, of where or he had already been before he went to Spain, uh, because that's a focus now of Nero. And so Paul is going like a protective parent to uh, provide in-person support uh, as necessary for uh, the people uh, he knows and loves there. And uh, so uh, since Nicopolis actually and Corinth are going to be the focus, uh, we talked uh, yesterday or last session about the... Uh, the games uh, that uh, Nero sets up these uh, games. And uh, it's like nine games uh, of the major games within an 18 month or uh, span of time. And uh, then there's all these little festivals and games in between. But uh, Nero's going to spend most of his time in Corinth. And so uh, Paul, uh, having been a former resident of Corinth and a church planter in Corinth and uh, having, you know, dear friends there and from there, uh, he's headed back to kind of dive into the, 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 
the trouble spot uh, because he knows what's going to happen there uh, with uh, Nero's behavior. And so if, uh, if we want to focus in on that at GNC on the map. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just going to give a big picture because, you know, Paul's over here in Spain. Again, we have him landing up here and then doing something in here. You've got all the mess going on with the fires in Rome. This area over here <laughs> is on fire. And then this area is really our focus and, and really in here. So if, let me see if I can zoom in here nicely. Give it one more. So Corinth is right here. Nicopolis here. This is, this is your whole uh, Aegean Sea. And so um, our first we, destination, Miletus, right? Well, and, and so that's what we think. Uh, and it really comes back to Second Timothy mm -hmm. uh, chapter 4, verse 20, where Trophimus is left in Miletus um, sick and ill. And, and uh, so we think he, he ends up landing here. And how he got there, hey, you know, uh, good luck. <laughs> he took a fast boat from from Spain somehow, or a few of them somehow, some way, got there as yep. quick as he could, I believe. You bet. And uh, but being in Miletus, uh, if, if everything uh, had gone like in the past, uh, he might have had Timothy meet him there. Uh, 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 and uh, it might not. Uh, if, he, if he drops Trophus, first of all, dropping Trophus, Trophimus in Miletus would lead me to believe that Trophimus was one of those people with him in Spain. Yes. Uh, Trophimus goes way back to, uh, you know, being in Jerusalem and being on that team of people uh, that Paul took in the book of Acts in the 20th chapter uh, the, over that way. So, uh, uh, but he could have seen or picked up Trophimus somewhere along the way. We don't, again, no, but uh, he's on the team. He's been traveling uh, for years with uh, Paul, it sounds like. So, hey, here's another great opportunity. And uh, so, it, it, but he's sick. And yeah. why would Paul and Dr. Luke leave somebody sick somewhere? Well, they're, they're on the run, like you said. They're, they, they have a, an urgency in this uh, section uh, uh, of being somewhere at a very particular time. And uh, I believe it's in Corinth for the games and Nero's presence there. But uh, uh so they drop him in Trophimus in Miletus. Miletus is one of the major ports for Ephesus, and Trophimus is from Ephesus. So uh, it makes sense for them to drop him there. Uh, if uh, he's telling Timothy this, and Timothy met him there, it might have happened. Trophimus got sick after Timothy left and went back to Ephesus, and uh, they drop him there. Or they just don't even see Timothy there, and uh, they drop they drop. Uh, Trophimus there, and that's why Timothy has uh, has to be told about it by Paul. Yeah, and I think well in the letter uh, yeah. later on. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, I was gonna say, so yeah. we to, we need to put Second Timothy in perspective. Second Timothy is yep. written in Rome while Paul is in in not just prison but a very very bad prison. Mm -hmm. Most likely Highest security dungeon yeah. uh, conditions prison. Yeah, and, uh, and um, you know most. Oh yeah, and 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 most likely this this is not one written by Paul I with his hand. He is probably underground with a little porthole above him and and dictating this letter to uh, to Luke. Uh, you know. We, could Luke get down underneath? We don't, you know, you, you just don't know. But but uh, this this letter is being written after the fact, you know. So uh, he he's leaving us these clues of what got him to Rome uh, and, and exactly. really following up with Timothy. Um, so he doesn't he doesn't it doesn't sound like he stays in uh, Miletus very long. Um, doesn't hang out there at all. Uh, he he leaves Trophimus. They're sick. Hopefully, they uh, got word to <laughs> to Trophimus's family. I'm I'm assuming, and uh, he's going to get taken care of. And then they're they're off again uh, to the next port that was famous for Paul stopping, and that's Troas. 
uh, up at the northern part of the Aegean there. And uh, in Troas, Paul is, uh, and this is of 2 Timothy 4.20, so we, we anchor it in that one where uh, Paul is, in, in 2 Timothy, he's telling Timothy to come to yeah. see him in Rome. Uh, you know, I don't know how long I've got type thing, uh, but it, bring my stuff. And he describes what the stuff is, uh, in part, at least. And uh, one of them is a cloak. It's a winter cloak. Uh, the the dungeon situation he's in, he's 12 feet under ground in a, and there's no, there's no heat. There's no, uh, you know, it's, it's like winter approaching. It's cold. And uh, this cloak is a very special, expensive cloak. It's a, it's from uh, neck to floor level. It's made out of a special black wool that comes from the Laodicean area, from the Colossi area. And it's right. waterproof, uh, very much so. This uh, woolen uh, coat is uh, a, a treasured thing to have in the cold and damp areas because it can waterproof things. And uh, so he's calling for that cloak uh, as winter is approaching. And uh, it could also be used to cover things uh, and to keep things uh, from damage while traveling. And uh, this cloak is also uh, possibly covering the other things he's asking for. He asks for uh, Biblios books. And uh, the books, uh, again, they're scrolls, actually. When we think of books, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, pages and a folding. But in this case, this literally means scrolls scrolls, papyrus scrolls, and uh, again, he's not specific about what it is, but the guesses as to what the scroll might have contained, letters written to him that he's kept, uh, letters, uh, copies of the letters he's written to others. It was uh, far for the course for your scribe to not only write you your letter, but he before they sent it off, they'd write you a copy of your letter, so you had it, kind of like, you know, keeping uh, your letter from the sent box. Uh, uh, filing it in your email somewhere so you, you knew uh, where it went uh, and what you wrote. So uh, in this case, you know, they had to do it literally manually. Well, and, and so, uh, yeah. well, and I think, I think back to <laughs> Paul's a tent maker. And for some reason, when I, when I read, uh, you know, he gives this description in uh, 2 Timothy 4.13, where, you know, I've got my cloak, my books, my, my, my parchment, uh, I've left it with carpus. But I think, I don't know why, but I think of a Civil War Worthless general. <laughs> I think of a Civil War general where they used to take and they, they'd have their, their office and they'd have this, this trunk that when it opened up, it was a desk and it had all their correspondence in it. And so when they had to travel quickly, they just pushed it, you know, pulled it back into a chest, put it onto the back of a cart, and away we go. Well, I think of Paul, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I think of Paul in this manner where he's just gotten back from Spain. And you know he's going to take all of his stuff with him, you know, and all of his correspondence with him. And I think of it as a trunk. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's right, but, you know, if he's on the run, he, he went to Miletus, he dropped off uh, Trophimus, he's up, he's up to, to, uh, to Troas, and he, he's probably staying with Carpus, and he leaves his stuff there. And obviously, because he left that there, it sort of gives you this sense of urgency that, you know, is somebody chasing him? Uh, or, or did he expect to get back to, 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 to uh, Troas, so he just left it there thinking yeah. it would be safer? You just don't know, but the it, it feels like the, uh, for lack of a better terms, the hounds of hell are on his footsteps <laughs> as he's going from town to town right now. Yeah. He wants to travel light uh, yeah. at this point, and uh, so uh, he's in a hurry, and he doesn't know uh, what's going to happen with that stuff and doesn't need it to burden him because it's slowing him down in the travel. No doubt. So, and you're right, that word fanole, which was the word for that cloak, it also evolved into meaning a, a compartment or a trunk, uh, possibly made of that waterproof uh, uh, felt, 
so uh, or, or woolen material. So uh, uh, very well, exactly what you're talking about. And Paul is in the travel industry. He grew up. That was his, he grew up in that family business, and so uh, no doubt he knew of all those innovations. And there, and one more piece, uh, like you're talking about, that would be in there. That he also mentions uh, besides the the scrolls of papyrus, he mentions uh, the it's a Latin word, which is very unusual in the New Testament to use the Latin word in this Greek uh, written, uh, these Greek written books and letters, and it's membrana. And that was a term for notebooks specifically. It was a general term for parchment, which was animal skins that they used. Uh, they lasted longer than papyrus. You could erase them and reuse them, uh, rewrite on them even by scratching off on it. Uh, and but uh, he, he says, especially bring those uh, notebooks and notebook is the term in that uh, in Rome and in the West. And he was in Rome for those two years with the house arrest. Uh, they were using in, in the first century BC and the first century AD, the, the parchment notebooks. It's unknown in the East and in Greece. And in fact, there's no word in the Greek. That's why he had to use that Roman word there's no word yet in the greek for those uh, notebooks because uh, it's that technology it's kind of the latest uh, media technology it, it hadn't made it over there yet and so uh he's uh, uh he's using something that eventually is going to be the hallmark of christian writers uh as uh, that one of the reasons christians uh were able to spread things that lasted uh better was they were using these uh membrana uh, to write uh, and even write uh, scripture and write gospels. And so that's some, some, most of everybody thinks Paul's notebooks probably had uh, Old Testament or Hebrew scripture prophecies that matched the Messiah's coming. And these were used by him. Uh, and it could even be uh, uh, that what he's talking about are uh, Hebrew scripture uh you know, uh, notes that he's written uh, over the years mm -hmm. as he's studying it himself and using it in, in talking to people in the synagogue uh, as well as, uh, you know, other places. So it's pretty powerful stuff that he's carrying and, and treasured for him because there is no uh, New Testament, you know, there's no, uh, so he, they could be, uh, some people have suggested uh, uh, early gospel writings by Luke or by, by Mark that he had in Rome and he had copies of it and he's carrying it around uh, still. So who knows? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's very intriguing just to think of the possibilities. I mean, from a, from a, what I would call a technical court thing, trial thing that, that, that he's about ready to go through there, there could definitely be the, the idea that some of this stuff, whether it be the, the, the books, the parchments, how, you know, the, since they are two categories of stuff that he's asking for, that could be his citizenship information, uh, you know. But then the other thing that's intriguing is we go with the assumption that the book of Hebrews is uh, is from Paul. Now, is it compiled by Luke? Uh, uh, we think so. There's 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 uh, grammar and structural issues there. But these things could be what is going to be the book of Hebrews because Paul is his, his mission is to the Gentiles, but because of what's going on. This book of Hebrews is definitely something that's going to uh, be a encouragement to the folks in the area of, of, of Israel that's on fire right now, uh, you know, and, and we're, you know, we're probably just a, a handful of years away from the temple being completely destroyed. Uh, and, and, you know, Paul may sense that, you know, the writings on the wall, so to say, uh, speak that the Jews are going to lose their center of worship, which is the temple. And I've got to convince them, you know, in one last, you know, go that, hey, the temple's not what you need to worship, <laughs> you know, 
it, it, there, there's one better than the temple, you know, when we get into to Hebrews and how that's really talking about it. So, um, you we'll know, talk you, more about that next time. But it, yeah. it, the, the idea is uh, when he gets into prison there in 67, let's say he's in Rome, incarcerated there in 67, early 68. Um, that's when uh, all that's left is Jerusalem to fall and yeah. Galilee and the rest of Judea has been taken. And he's uh, writing to his priestly Jewish uh, colleagues that he knows, whether they're there in Jerusalem or they're gone and they're, uh, you know, hiding out in other places. Uh, he's writing to say, hey, Messiah's come. So, you know, the, the, the old is the old and the new is the new. And uh, uh, there's, there's still hope. It's not the end of us. It's uh, a, new, a new stage and page. And his idea, obviously, that Messiah has come and uh, embrace it. So uh, we'll, we'll talk more tomorrow about that. So in the meantime, okay, so Emperor Nero. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, let me let me point you in the direction of I think where you're going because Nero is in Corinth. Yeah. And well, he he he's uh, in, in in September. He's actually in Nicopolis. So he's up uh, up here. So, yeah, he's up here where that uh, little anchor is. There, uh, he's come across from the Roman uh, Peninsula, and the uh, there's this big uh, pomp and a ceremony for the first uh, game of this uh, 66 season, and that's the Actia games that we talked about uh, the other day when we talked about Nicopolis um, being the a place where uh, Caesar Augustus uh, kind of poured uh, lots of energy and uh, finances and urban renewal to create a new city there that became the bustling uh, trade hub uh, of that area. And uh, he instituted games that became uh, very famous, and uh, people traveled from all over to go to. And so uh, this is where Nero begins what's going to be a, a nine-game uh, calendar. The 211th Olympiad uh, is postponed two years to accommodate this calendar uh, that Nero's setting up. Uh, the Corinth Isthmian Games are going to be held twice in one year rather than once every other year. And uh, the uh, Actia games, which are held every four years, they're going to do it again and, uh, in the next year, uh, planned for 67, just so Nero can keep doing these tours and uh, stay in this area to have an influence. So uh, the dark, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, you just think about this. You know, uh, so on the West, Rome is basically, you know, the fire's over, but the rebuilding is, oh, is, yeah. is and, and the struggles with all that still going the on. Unrest, there. yeah. And then here, you know, over here uh, on the east, Jerusalem is in revolt, and we're having to, you know, at this point, Roman troops are getting killed and slaughtered, and we're having to feed that beast. So what do we do? Right here in the middle, <laughs> we create the biggest distraction we can think about. Let's have the games, you know, that way we'll take everybody's mind off everything. Right, especially his. Uh, and the the, uh, the deal is it, he does a lot of like what we do for entertainment. He fancies himself a rock star uh, and an athlete. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's the way he's gonna be a hero. Uh, is be, is, is comp he's gonna be the first time ever that a Roman emperor competes in any of these games. Uh, so it, it's like uh, freaky uh, for everybody uh, that he, he creates this buzz about these games and they're collecting all the best athletes and all the best uh, poets and musicians from all over to be at these places. So, uh, you know, he's creating quite a spectacle uh, and it's a traveling show. Oh, that's going to last, you know, almost a couple of years. So uh, people are drawn to it, and uh, and he's inviting people to it as well. Uh, he calls it the Grand Tour, and so that's what we're going to, as we say, the Grand Tour uh, from here on out. This is what Nero calls this, the Grand Tour of the Games. And uh, if if we could put it into today's vocabulary, this is the Academy Awards, the Tonys, the Super Bowl. 
the World Series, the NBA Finals, yeah. all happening at the same time. And just to keep them going, we'll just do them a couple of times in a row. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, why not? <laughs> if once wasn't good enough, we'll do it again. Yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. crazy. Um, now, I do want to mention one thing, and it comes from uh, 2 Timothy uh, 1, uh, verse uh, basically 14 and 15. And it's this advice to Timothy, you know, to, to be on your guard. And because, you know, you are aware that, look, when I was in Asia, we had some people that were turning away, you know, so you get this idea um, that some of the fringe characters that have been in Paul's life, uh, there's so much pressure from the Romans, you know, and so much hatred that's happening towards the Christians and the Jews, that people that Paul may have trusted at one time are now turning against him for their own good. You know, uh, in, in this case, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, Fred and Hermie, uh, for lack of a better term, that, that are, are basically, you know, uh, turning aside from him. And we're going to find out later that, uh, you know, one of, one of his tradesmen friends uh, may be the one that when he gets into Corinth uh, causes some problems. Let's just put it that way. So, so we, get, we, get, uh, we get this idea that people are turning away from Paul uh, during, during this crazy, crazy time. Um, so he gets to Corinth. It's absolutely true. In yeah. fact, uh, uh, well, uh, a couple things going on. Uh, Nero gets there uh, and uh, he uh, starts, well, in the words of, this is a Roman historian, Dio Cassius says, Nero devastated the whole of Greece while he was there, precisely as if he had been sent out to wage war. He slew great numbers of men, women, and children. At first, he commanded the children and freedmen of those who were executed to leave him half their property at their death and be allowed the victims themselves to make wills in order that he might not appear to be killing them for their money. So he, he uh, has, uh, you know, the make wills to leave it to him. And later he takes away the entire property of those who were executed uh, rather than waiting for them to die and will him the, that. And he banishes all the children at one time by a single decree. Uh, uh, Nero is going there and he's basically confiscating wealth and property there in uh, Greece and in Corinth. And uh, another um, uh, a Jewish classicist, uh, Louis Feldman, uh, writes that, uh, he was at New York's Yeshiva University, by the way, uh, here in the US, and he wrote uh, about an, the uh, prejudice against Jews in uh, Greece and Asia Minor, for that matter, and their wealth as well as the success of uh, Judaism and Christianity, which was a, a messianic Judaism at the time, perceived by them at least, uh, as uh, winning people over to their uh, faith rather than uh, them staying with their traditional faith, uh, the, the paganisms of, and the various deities of, of Greece and uh, Asia Minor and Rome. And so, uh, the people in Greece may have been ambiguous about Nero slaying people and taking their property if it was uh, this people they were uh, prejudiced against. They may have kind of turned their, the other way and just let it happen. And so uh, Nero's pillaging uh, and doing it legally in, in courts uh, that he's holding as the imperial court. But... Uh, He's ravishing, ravaging uh, that whole area. And uh, I might uh, also, uh, there, uh, I'll just mention Corinth, uh, the four stays he lands there, <coughs> excuse me, in Corinth. Uh, and uh, when his first visit there is in uh, uh, 66, uh, getting to be toward the winter. And he, uh, initiates or launches a major construction project there where there's two harbors, one in the Aegean on the east, and uh, there's the Isthmus, uh, which they named the Isthmian Games after, 
And then on the west, there's another harbor uh, going uh, to the Adriatic, in, in the Adriatic. And uh, he proposed it, uh, and other people had uh, proposed it in the past, uh, uh, a canal be built. And so they start, they actually start with uh, uh, slave labor. Uh, I believe it was uh, like 6,000 is the number of quoted of slaves brought in to build that uh, Isthmian canal. And uh, that's, he's, I, I call it a form of bribery right from the beginning for Corinth so that they uh, behave and they, uh, you know, uh, do what he wants them to do because he's doing something that it, people have promised and would be a, a, an incredible economic gain if you could uh, jump uh, in Corinth from the Aegean to the Adriatic because uh, the way to do it otherwise was to sail all the way around uh, the Greek uh, peninsulas, and uh, kind of the fingers down there and uh, uh, south on the map there. And uh, that was uh, several days more. And the other way that it was done uh, currently in Corinth on the Isthmus was they actually would put the ship up on uh, logs and actually drag it across. Uh, and that took uh, several days. So if you could do it where in one day uh, in a canal you were across, hey. Uh, so he was promising some a big, uh, big uh, economic deal. And so of course they're gonna say, okay. You're talking about this area. That, this area. that area right in there, that's correct. The, the, you see the two anchors and those are the two ports. Uh, Sincre is the one on the um, the one on the Adriatic. Uh, excuse me, I, I, I wasn't close enough. Le Lechion is in the Adriatic, and Sincre is on the Aegean. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and he's going to build a canal there. Well, truth be told, we'll zip forward uh, a couple of millennia. That didn't happen until the late 1800s, uh, where a canal actually got built. So uh, though he started the project, they never finished and didn't get, get close. Uh, but again, that was that kind of bribery he uses to uh, get them to get them to uh, be cool. Second time he stays, he probably winters there. Which uh, that's time for his, uh, his intelligence gathering and then uh, ensuing executions of people who were either not uh, loyal or who were uh, people that he just wanted to get rid of and didn't like, a uh, contributing factor that prejudice that we talked about. The games, uh, the Isthmian games take place uh, as the first set of games in the spring of uh, 67. So uh, he's there for uh, the games there. And uh, then he takes off on the other tours uh, uh, down into Greece uh, of a uh, where the other games are held. And we won't spend time going there uh, because we have so much to cover, but uh, <laughs> he'll end up back in Corinth in uh, September of 67 with a third visit. And he, that was probably a brief one because all he really wanted to do is get to uh, Lechion, uh, the, the Adriatic port of Corinth to get to Nicopolis uh, on a ship to the next, uh, oh, there you go, installment of the, Actia games. So, uh, uh, yeah. And uh, then finally, we're in September of 67. But that, that's the September with Nicopolis. But then they arranged for the second set of Isthmian games, which was originally supposed to be in the spring of 68, to happen in November of 67. And that's because Helios, who Nero had left in charge, he was his freedman. He'd left in charge in Rome for anything going on in the city of Rome uh, to uh, uh, deal with it there. Helios had sent messengers to the uh, wherever Nero was in Greece and the games in Corinth, particularly saying, hey, you need to get back here. There's another plot against you. And if you don't come back, you, you, there's nothing to come back to. And uh, Nero just ignored them all, didn't even, didn't even answer. And... Uh, so Helios gets on a ship and goes to Corinth himself uh, in person. And I'm sure Nero was pretty shocked to see Helios, who he left in charge in Rome, you know, uh, uh, who gets right in his face and says, you need to get 
back to Rome. It's bad. The people, there's another plot like Piso's coup uh, that's brewing, and it's happening in the in the West, in Spain, uh, with those uh, governors are plotting against uh, Nero. It's happening, uh, not plotting, but things are certainly uh, crazy in the Far East, in uh, Israel, with the Jew Jewish war and great revolt. And things aren't any better in Rome, where uh, the plots and the fires and all that happened uh, in the rebuilding. You know, that kind of rebuilding doesn't happen over, even in our own day. Think about uh, the hurricane in New Orleans. And the, it took years, and there's still places that aren't rebuilt. Uh, so, uh, you know, that kind of rebuilding project uh, it gets tiring and, and laborious. And so anyway, uh, they're pulling him out of there. So, uh, but there, he grants Corinth something else he promised at that last one before he goes back to Rome in December of 67, he gives them a liberation. He, make, he allows them to become their own uh, free uh, city. And so they, uh, they're one of the side effects of that, though uh, it's exciting for them, it's also it takes it out of the Senate and the Roman Senate's uh, jurisdiction and puts it under the emperor directly. So uh, there, there's method to his madness. Uh, truly, in, in this case, and Corinth is right at the center of it all. So uh, when we talk about Paul getting there uh, and, and wanting to get there to support the people that he knows, uh, that's a big part of it. Uh, before I talk about uh, one other morality issue, do you want to? Well, I was going to say, uh, I, I know, I know we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, um, so we've got so much going on, you know, it, Nero is sitting there in, in Corinth up, up in here doing all the games. Paul just gets back from Spain. And now he's uh, Nero is being told, Hey, there's a plot against you. And by the way, it's happening up here in Spain. And, and so Paul, who is a Jew is now going into Corinth. And by the way, during this time, uh, Nero is like, I got to send, uh, you know, some more people over to the Jewish revolt that's going on. Going on. So now Paul gets, uh, you know, Corinth is, is a hub for some craziness anyways. I mean, you can read the first and second uh, letters to the Corinthians and you can find that there's a lot of moral issues going on. And basically, Paul gets to Corinth. And you, I'm going to let you I let you talk about sort of the moral issues, but I want to set up a little bit about what's coming coming up. Nero's been just killing people left and right in Corinth for his own good, but now Paul finds his way into Corinth, really on purpose. I mean, but Paul gets captured, and he doesn't get killed right away. Uh, he he gets, and we think he gets caught probably in Corinth. It could be in Nicopolis. I mean, so you leave that open, but he gets captured in this area. And he is not the guy that Nero wants to basically just off quickly because he's coming from Spain. He's been friends with Seneca, obviously. He's a Jew. And oh, by the way, he already has a record against him. Uh, and by the way, he's a leader of the Christians, which we believe they killed or they burned down the city. Right. And he left right before the city burned down. So. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> that's just a small, small little thing, you know. So yeah. his wanted poster is full of. Uh... Oh, goodness. <laughs> I mean, his rap sheet in Nero's eyes is is uh, is a basically the scroll size of Genesis in the in the Pentateuch. I mean, it just keeps going and going and going. <laughs> so. I guess talk a little bit about the moral issues as we sort of get into. The While we're there, I'm gonna. I'm... Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I, sure. I, I, wherever you want to go. <laughs> well, I was going to mention that because uh, this this section we can talk about here is the extradition of Paul. Yeah. It's a choice for him to end up back in Rome, being arrested in Corinth. If he's arrested there, Corinth is. It, it was interesting because 
in all our studies, uh, Corinth was one of those places that keeps coming up by scholars to say we think he got arrested in Corinth or even Nicopolis but yeah. nobody ever mentioned the grand tour and, yeah. uh, it was through our uh, kind of stumbling on uh, K.R. Bradley's uh, article about Nero's uh, itinerary and all, all his time spent in Corinth and then reading the historians about his stays in in Corinth and Greece that we put it together like hey oh. <laughs> It was definitely, it's definitely an aha moment. Um, and, and just to peel a little bit away of how we sort and of- it's on the, the timetable of yeah. the, yeah. No, no keep, it, keep going. It's on, it's on the timetable of the ancient writers uh, who say that Paul was executed in 67 or 68. Uh, they're writing, you know, after it happened, but they're trying to describe when that, well, this is the timetable right here uh, of an arrest in Corinth, uh, a, an extradition to Rome for the, uh, for the incarceration of the dungeon and trial. So it, it was like, wow, <laughs> all I believe for that. And there's one, one writer that, uh, did talk about it uh, that was on the internet, uh, but uh, that that's it. He, he was the only connector of these events. And I, I think it's something that needs more coverage and more uh, information about it. But so there's two prime examples of the execution of three Roman citizens and not just Roman citizens, but they're Roman officials who uh, uh, Nero actually invites to, to Corinth. Uh, to come be, be with him while he's staying there for the games, and uh, one is, uh, uh, and I'll, you know, I'm not, I don't know my Latin as well as I should, but uh, it's uh, Naeus Domitius Corbulo, and Corbulo was a general uh, who was very popular. He's well connected uh, in the uh, Roman senatorial uh, families and patrician families, and he's kind of like a war hero for everybody as well. And uh, Nero invites him and kind of butters him up, up in his letter of invitation that he's like a father to him and a benefactor to him. So, um, you know, please join me here. Well, little does Corbulo know that when Corbulo steps off uh, the, uh, the, the boat, the ship in the harbor, uh, that the Roman troops, uh, the Praetorian Guard have orders to get the get a uh, sword out and kill him right on the spot. Nero doesn't even want to see it happen. Uh, he just wants him dead and dead right away. And Corbulo doesn't give Nero the satisfaction and pulls his, his own sword and kills himself, uh, but it still happens. See, there's a choice here of where and how somebody dies. Just because you're a Roman citizen and you say, well, I want to go to see Caesar in court in Rome, it doesn't necessarily fly. And uh, oh. I'll, I'll bring up the second uh, the second example, and then uh, you can go. There's two brothers uh, who, again, uh, fairly famous. They were there was an upper German province and a lower German province, and even each of these Scriboni brothers, uh, one governed uh, the northern province and one governed the southern pro Roman province of Germany, and he invites them there. And what happens when they get there? He compels them to commit suicide. I'll either uh, kill you torturously or you can kill yourself in a quiet manner, and they do. So uh, he could have done Paul in right there in Corinth when Paul got arrested, but that's not what he chose. And uh, we think uh, they chose to make him a big example of all the things you just mentioned uh, here's a guy that was in Spain where rebellion's brewing. Here's a guy that was everywhere he's been, there's revolts and rebellion going on. And he's kind of a leader, uh, uh, you know, of this one group of people, the Christians that caused trouble in Rome itself in a big disaster. So, yeah, uh, he wants to take him back to Rome. And there's a tradition of victorious uh, triumph uh, processions where they actually would bring uh, the defeated uh uh, enemy uh, into Rome, they would pass by the Mamertine or the, the uh, carcer prison, the state prison, and they drop the person, the humiliated person off there, and then go on into the Circus Maximus or one of the arenas 
and have a big uh, celebration. And sure enough, uh, Nero does that, though we d there's nothing that says he did that and he dropped Paul off there. Boy, that would make a whole lot of sense uh, yeah. that something like that were to happen uh, because he is going to make a public display of him in his execution. Yeah. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Uh, I mean, basically, what you what you get is the days of saying, "Oh, I'm a Roman citizen," and getting uh, preferential treatment like Paul has uh, across his early missionary trips. Uh, that's gone. Uh, that that's gone. I mean, you you the the rules of the game are are at the whim of Nero. And like you say, we get Paul coming from That's Troas right. somehow getting into the Corinth area. And I will just keep it saying the Corinth area because it could be Corinth. It could be up mm -hmm. at Apocalypse. It could be wherever these games are going on. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what we think, and, it, and it's, it is speculation at its best, but uh, there is a line that Paul says about Alexander the coppersmith that did him much harm that leads us to believe that, hey, he gets to, let's just say it's Corinth. He gets to downtown Corinth and Alexander's sitting there and he's like, oh, I can, I can get, uh, you know, some in here with, with Nero or, and his guys and basically say, hey, this is the guy you want. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine the, <laughs> the enthusiasm uh, for capturing Paul, this leader of the Christians, this guy from, that just got back from Spain, who's a Jew, uh, who has just caused trouble all over the place. You know what? It's time to have some fun. And I know, you know, Nero's sitting there going, I got to go back up to Rome. There's something I got to take care of and make sure that, uh, you know, there's not another plot against my life. This will help me. I'm going to bring this guy in, vic in victory through the city. And if you look at the map, you know, it's, it's a short boat ride basically up here and then right, right along the way back to Rome and the festivities begin <laughs> so yeah. he actually uh nero will land if i'm not mistaken uh i'm trying to think of where uh, uh modern naples is now because they always talk about that but the port he lands in uh is on the west coast of italy uh with his uh triumph procession and parade so uh i'm my mind's going blank on what the uh, ancient name for it was, uh, but I, I, I'm I'll thinking have, I'll it have was, it here uh, in a second. <laughs> the Tioli. No, sorry about that. Well, I have one up here too. Let's see. Uh, yeah. The Naples. It's it is probably Patoli. Yeah, yeah, it's Patoli. It's so, so it's right here, which exactly. is interesting. Um, we think that's where he landed before. Exactly. Yeah. The, so. So most likely then, if he's Paul leaving on from uh, and two, uh, yeah. So most likely, if and he's safer, leaving, yeah, yeah if safer to land there because in Ost the Ostia, which was a closer port, that's where the Spanish were coming in all the time with Spain's trade. And if Spain was brewing, uh, um, you know, rebellion uh, as it was at the time he'd be uh, less safe there. So again, th we're talking high security. The Secret Service is all over keeping Nero safe, even though they may not necessarily uh, uh, be enamored of him. They're doing their job and they're, they're uh, very, uh, you know, they're just loyal to the, to the dignity and integrity of their job. So they're, they're keeping him safe. Oh yeah. So, I mean, it, depending on where he left, he probably came around and up, very similar to the um, the route that Paul would have taken from uh, Malta, you know, Syracuse, right up here, up here. But you know, yes. 
if if it's Nero's procession, they're getting they're getting a a, a direct route, <laughs> pretty pretty good. Um, so I mean, he he ends up, you know, Absolutely. he ends up in in Rome, and uh, we'll learn uh, basically in the next next session what goes on there because um, there is no hope. Uh, you know, when he, when Paul gets to Rome this, this next time, it is not like reading the book of Philippians. Uh, it is not like reading the, the anticipation of Philemon and, and uh, Colossae in those letters. It, this is reading second Timothy, which is, Hey, I, <laughs> I'm in chains I am being poured out as a drink offering now. My race is run. Yeah, you know, which which is games imagery. Which, games which, uh, imagery. We you have pointed out that well, how appropriate is the language of Second uh, Timothy in the fourth chapter, like verses uh, six through eight, where exact exactly saying that I have fought the good fight, which is a word for a you know a, a games event. Uh, I've finished the course. Uh, I, I'm going to have laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Well, that crown, they didn't give medals in those days. They gave a crown or a laurel, actually, of, of uh, each city had its own uh, vegetation that uh, was uh, indicative of it. And they would give that crown to the winner. Uh, and, and so Paul's using total game imagery to talk about uh, having run the good race and fought the good fight. And... Uh, the the Lord, uh, the righteous judge, like the judges in a uh, athletic competition, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So uh, he's not just talking about himself, but then he opens it up to everybody who's uh, in jeopardy and in danger, uh, and it, and everybody who's uh, run the good race. What uh, what and then? Uh, Hebrews has its own imagery with uh, chapter 12 and the great cloud, or I like to call it the great crowd of witnesses that they're in the stands and the, the people that are living it out now are on the playing field and uh, they're cheering us on. Well, it's uh, second Timothy is such a, a polemic with meaning, you know, it, it, it's such a, a comparison and opposite uh, of, of what true reward is uh, because He's using what he just saw. I mean, he was just in Corinth in this, this, and captured in that area where these games, games of epic proportion, something that probably none of us even can come close to understanding. Even the pageantry of, of our Olympics was probably, you know, a shadow of, of what Nero would have been doing. And that's what Paul saw before he was captured. And obviously his trip from this area to Rome was not a comfort cruise whatsoever. I mean, th this is harsh, harsh, harsh uh, traveling. So when he gets to Rome and he's, you know, really, you know, dictating this, this letter to Timothy, you know, through the bars to, to, uh, to Luke, that's what's in his mind. And he's sitting there saying, you know, I'm, I'm getting a crown uh, that, that's imperishable, you know? And when someone won these games and they won the crown, basically they got a front row seat from that point on to the games forever, uh, all right? Well, here's the thing. Forever obviously didn't last all that long because the Coliseum right now is a wreck. <laughs> you know, uh, the the Colosseum in, in in Corinth is are, you know ruins, and, and so Paul's using this polemic language of hey, you know, I've I've done my course, and and my course and my crown are laid up in heaven where it's imperishable. You know, it's it's forever, it's eternal. So it's it's there's so much more meaning when you read. Second Timothy, when you know what's going on, and what's going on is is Nero's nuts, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, right. It's not Nero fiddled while uh, Rome burned. It's uh, Nero uh, went into chariot races, and uh, uh, while 
how uh, the Roman Empire uh, burned, yeah. and uh, he was kind of a crazy guy. In fact, uh, he, I, I didn't mention it, but uh, uh, or did I mention where he was given the garland? He was told to be the winner of the chariot race at the Olympics yeah. uh, in that uh, grand tour version of the Olympics, and he didn't even finish the race. His chariot it about halfway through uh broke apart and uh he was he had to be carried off the field but they gave him that anyway because they said if he would have finished he would have won well you know how about a little bribery involved there <laughs> well, intimidation but if we don't say one boy are we going to be in deep so <laughs> you know and you can you can take what i mean what what paul is saying is absolutely true when he says you know i i have I have run my race, I you know, and and I have won, and I'm getting the crown. And that crown, yeah. and that is, you gotta you gotta think that is nothing that that is nothing but true. But it also has that underlying thing of, hey Nero, I finished <laughs> the race. Yeah. You didn't even finish the race, and you well, got your little crown. <laughs> you know, so uh, if you don't, I mean, that's the great thing about this is you see these these this deeper deeper meaning or deeper layers of it. different layers yes yeah. uh, many layers going on there so i thought i'd pray us out uh, as yeah. i know our time is is about up and i wanted to use a prayer from ephesians that uh, uh likewise uh, paul saw a lot of and interacted with a lot of and he uses it as this image that uh, uh gives us an idea about his bravery uh, uh and the bravery he's encouraging us all to have, and that's the armor of God. Uh, we use that as a, as a prayer, if I may. So uh, finally, uh, Paul prays, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, again, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Take, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes of your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up your shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication prayers for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So peace to you and to the brothers and sisters in love and faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So our next session, we will find Paul, hate to say it, but six feet under. 12 feet under. 12 feet under. <laughs> Times two. That's right. There you go. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so we will, we will enter into Rome. They dig, and, him, they dig him a deeper grave. There you go. Uh, and, and, and really, uh, what's, where we're going is we are going to complete Paul's mission next week, uh, or next session, I should say. And then uh, we wrap up this whole series with basically, you know, we thought that, uh, you know, we asked the question, is there life after Acts for Paul? And really, is there life after Acts for us? Because we're still part of this line uh, that, that, uh, of the way. So it'll be great. So with that, Thank you, Gary. We made it through another one, and we will see you soon. Blessings. Thanks, Chris.